a pleasure. Uh, to begin with a brief but very heartfelt thank you to the curators, the House der Kultur und der Welt, the, all the technical and the teams and the participants and the audience, of course, for this very exciting event and the discussion that has already begun and that will go on. I will talk, as Nana mentioned, about what some of you maybe already know because it has been shown here, I think, a few years ago. An event which took place in 2011 in the summer, in, in spring, which is known as the Left to Die Boat Case. And I will take some illustrations from, yeah, from a video by Charles Zeller and Lorenzo Pezzani from the Forensic Oceanography team. I will say a few words about them. And this video, which is very interesting, can be found on the web. You can find it by Googling Left to Die Boat Case or LR Pezzani and you will find it. Uh, these events happened four years before what Bern Kasparek uh, talked about, the summer of migration. But I think um, it shows also the same thing, it sh shows also the same state of emergency that Bern uh, talks about in his paper, routes, corridors and spaces of exception governing migration in, Euro in Europe, which has been published in the Near Future website, which contains also very interesting material, uh, the vocabul new vocabulary on migration, which was also mentioned, and in which Bernd, some others, and Sandro uh, took part. Um, this 2011, it was the time of the Arab Spring. Uh, maybe we could use a lot of quotes, because these are Media, media terms and things like that. But that was the Arab Springs, that was also the L Libyan uprising, and so it was also an interruption into a special kind of European policy on migration, which has been implemented at the beginning of, let's say, in 2003 to 2004, which is the externalization. Very briefly, externalization, uh, is the way uh, the European Union as a whole and the member states delegate to countries outside Europe, whether uh, nearby countries or countries in Africa, in Northern Africa, or even farther, as it is the case right now, the burden to uh, stop, detain, whatever the cost, the migrants. And it's also a way for them to not to, have, uh, not to um, respect the obligation of the international treaties they have signed, and some of them are even the foundation, but the European Union and the member states do not respect these treaties. Okay, I'm no friend of the late Mr. Gaddafi or the actual Mr. Erdogan, but I don't like that the uh, finger is pointed to them saying, oh, they do not respect or they do not, did not even sign this, the European Treaty on uh, Human Rights. The member states of the Union are each year, Spain, you can name all of them, Spain, Belgium, Germany, France, are condemned by the European Court of Human Rights each year, even several times every year, for uh, breaching Article is it 11 or 13, which is um, inhumane and degrading treatment. So we are, the, the, the European member states are no one to give lesson to some dictators and tyrants with whom they sign treaties or they sign agreements and which, they have, which have the burden of doing their dirty job. So externalization had been in full bloom since 2004 and at that time after the, uh, the two different Libyan embargoes had been lifted. Gaddafi was the darling of the European Union and of all the uh, wide sort of also of industry and capital all through the world. And everybody was trying to uh, give him money, having built camps, having built roads, uh, uh, securing a border and a technological border at the, at the south of Libya and then let's not say all of a sudden, but uh, in 2011, so the Arab Spring and the Libyan uprising. And then 
In response to this Libyan uprising, an international coalition launched a military intervention in the country. As of March 23, 2011, NATO started enforcing an arms embargo off the coast of Libya. So during the period of the events of the Left to Die boat, the central Mediterranean Sea was being monitored with unprecedented scrutiny, enabling NATO and participating states to become aware of any distress of migrants and therefore be effective in assisting them. The Left to Die boat case, as it is aptly titled, showed that no one came to rescue. And so we could ask the question, is it that the NATO and the armed forces and also the Frontex a, a European agency were powerless by design, to quote the title of a very good book by Michel Feyer, who was also involved in the near future and in his own books about the war in Yugoslavia at the beginning of the 90s, or would it be, um, but this can be debated and could be interesting, but I'd rather stick with what Bernd Kasparik says in this paper about the summer of migration and the follow-up. It's rather, it rather shows an inability to provide and forecast help or any migration policies. So uh, let's go to the uh, left to die boat case, which gave way to a wide coalition of NGO researchers, migrants, civil society to keep the testimonies, file complaints, and see what could be done after the case. So uh, I think the first, ah, oh, fantastic. So these are screenshots taken from the uh, LF Pezzani video. This one is just to show the trajectory of the boat. It started in Libya, this is the line on the left. Then very quickly, the, uh, there was uh, no more gas and they were, then they arrived, they wanted to go to Lampedusa. I'm not sure we can see it. It's the dark spot between the trajectory of the boat and Sicily. And they were supposed to go to, uh, to, to go to Lampedusa in not more than 24 hours. The journey lasted for 15 days. And of these 15 days, 14 were days of drift. And so after they came back to the Libyan coast and then the boat was uh, washed out by a tempest. So this is the trajectory of the boat. Now let's go back to what was the state, this is what I was telling you. Uh, the, the zone, the, the pink zone is the NATO surveillance area, so which was very wide and very near uh, the, um, the Libyan coast. And there were uh, something like 38 warships. The, uh, what Nana mentioned in presenting my uh, speech was that there was a wide means of surveillance, what we can call, what LR and Pezzani call forensics, like can be made in legal medicine, which are means which are used for surveillance, control, and in the case of the Mediterranean, at that time, but also now, to prevent the migrant boats from arriving to Europe. So, uh, th there were military vessels, there were fishing boats, there were planes, there were helicopters, um, there was also uh, AIS, which is a, a vessel tra tracking system, uh, and also remote sensing technology, which can provide the identity, the, the identification, the position, and the speed of large commercial vessels. There were also radar imagery satellites. So a whole set of things that can be used to track and control. So this is what the Mediterranean near the Libyan coast looked like when uh, the boat left. And this is the 38 vessels shown by the imagery which were around the vessel when it, uh, when it 
it had no fuel, the migrants on board, so yeah, I forgot to say that there were 72 migrants on board, including women and children, when they left on March 27, 2011. They drifted for 15 days, and the boat sank on April 10, 2011. Women and children and men had died, 63 of them, during the journey or at the time of the shipwreck, which was caused by a tempest. And at that time, the guys from Forensic uh, Oceanography, from interrogating the uh, coast guards, from discussing with the guys in charge of the satellite imagery, with also by looking to what is called as Jane's List, which is a commercial list which states all the vessels on a, an, an itinerary, where they come from, where they were, also looking at the weather forecast and also most of all, by interviewing the migrants, with the survivors, which was the most important thing to do because it was their journey, their struggle, their, the death of their, uh, of their friends. And so they were able to show that there was the responsibility of several states, of the NATO, of all the people who had come near and who had not come to their rescue. There were also Tunisian fishermen who were in the area, which did not intervene, but the Tunisian, at that time, the Tunisian fishermen had been several times accused of being smugglers, so they do not come near migrant boats for fear of being accused and being jailed, and, uh, which, has been the, which had been the case before uh, the Left to Die boat case. Um, so, there was a, a coalition of NGO, there were a coalition of NGO investigating the case. I'm a member of a French group called GST, Group d'Information et Support des Immigrés. We had launched a press release on June 9, which was called, GST will file a complaint against NATO, the EU, and the countries participating in the coalition operating in Libya. There were also some journalists, Emiliano Boss, working on that. And there were also activists, which were in Tunisia at that time, discussing the fact that could it be, uh, could, could, it, could there be an inquiry? And then also, could it be possible to file a complaint? So the, uh, Charles Ella and Lorenzo Pedani did a very thorough inquiry, which they explain in, uh, in the video and which also uh, is explained in several of their, uh, of their papers. There's one which is called, yeah, Ebbing and Flowing, the EU Shifting Practice of Non-Assistance and Bordering uh, Across Land and Sea, where they talk about the um, left to die, but also several other cases. So the forensic oceanography turned the knowledge generated through surveillance, forensic, into evidence of responsibility for the crime of non-assistance and into tools used by the civil societies, the movements, the activists, and most of all the migrants, what they call forensics. Um, but the most important thing they did was to talk with the survivors to, and not to have... Uh, um, to, to have them tell their story, where they were, what was the weather, which also allowed them to cross, the, uh, cross it with the, um, with the weather forecast and with things like that. Um, what else could I say? Yeah, so... From that and from these kind of cases, they will. They, they also had. They launched last year another project, which is called Death by Rescue, which is also interesting in terms of migrant move, migrant struggles and also legal issues. If the legal issues can be addressed, there's a report also which you can find. There's a website, a report, and a video which will make public next in the next week, I guess. So if you Google death by rescue, you will have it. It's stated as 
since the last operation, the last Frontex operation near the Libyan and the shifting of the surveillance to the Libyan Coast Guards, there is, there is no rescue anymore. And the rescue is left to large commercial vessels which, where the personnel do not know how to go, come to rescue and the boats are far too large not to be dangerous. And they have documented a few cases of boats which capsized and several deaths because of the attempted rescue. And they are coming to Rome to discuss with lawyers, I think next week or in the next 15 days, to see if some cases could be made about that. Once again, using uh, the, this forensics uh, thing. But the legal issues have not been that fantastic. There were um, seven complaints against member states, France, Italy, Belgium, Spain, UK, the USA, and Canada. Uh, these were um, filed in 2012, and from the time being, several of them have been dismissed. For example, in France, the case has been dismissed on the basis of the French army answers, who say, no, we, we were not there, there was no boat, we never been through, we never been near a boat like that. And, uh, so there are, of course, uh, appeals to the European Court of Human Rights. We can talk about that later. I have a, I'm not a legal person, but I have a few documents and answers about that. So I think <coughs> this raises I, uh, questions about uh, about the legal issues. Could there be any legal issues? I think the legal issues are also interesting. Maybe we can discuss that tomorrow because there's also the question that maybe you've heard that from since January, but also February, there has been a lot of responses from European institution, the European Tribunal, the European Ombudswoman and the Commission stating that no, we cannot accept your complaint because the so-called EU-Turkey agreement is not an agreement if it was to uh, be, uh, it doesn't go with the requirements of Article 100, 128 of the founding treaty. So before the complaints were not accepted because there was an, there was an agreement and now they are not accepted because there is no agreement. So the tribunal and the ombudswoman tried to make a little bit of humanitarian discourse saying to the commission, but you have to, your press release or your, the commission say it's a political declaration, which was issued from the March 18, 2016, so-called EU-Turkey agreement from the European Council. So you have to take more into account and you have to monitor much the uh, human rights issues and things like that, but uh, sorry, Pardon my French, which is English, but the migrants, the migrants are fucked either way. Before, when it was recognized, when it was said that it was an, an agreement, and now, where everybody agrees to say it's not an agreement. This is what we, the activist Migros Europe Justien, we said since the beginning. We say, no, this is no agreement because we looked, I think we discussed with Bern that, and he said he also tried to track this famous agreement, and we asked uh, journalist friends, we ask people in the commission, we ask activists, we ask people from the Green Party. Uh, there's no trace of an official document. So we said, okay, it's a gigantic press release from the council, from the, uh, the meeting of uh, March 18, and this is what it was, and it is a lethal agreement, but okay. So does it raise new legal, very pessimistic issues? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there, there is also the, the, the fact that there has been pressure on the Greek courts which had stated that some people could not be deported to Turkey because Turkey was not a safe country in the world. And there have been pressure to, in changes of the, um, of the Greek courts. Uh, it's also something which has to be discussed. Um, so this forensics turned into forensics, appropriation of the ways of the enemy and to become, five minutes, oh my God, uh, to become our, the tools of the movements. Um, so what is the effectiveness of the legal struggle? 
the idea also being to discuss how the migrants in this case, but also in others, became actors on both sides of the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean became a laborate, is a border, of course, but a shifting border, uh, is a laboratory for practices of, so I very much like to discuss with you all, uh, is it a Mediterranean citizenship? Is it a transnational citizenship? Citizenship, of course, not in the sense of a status, but a common struggle for defining the modalities of a common life as Sandro Medjadra and Brett Nielsen state in uh, Border as Method, and Sandro addresses this idea in several uh, other texts. Um, Migrop, who I don't know if it was Bern or Nana who said that this, okay, this is a network which is European but also African, and we um, analyze European migration policy, we combat them, we see their effects, their tools, which are Frontex, the visa regime, the Schengen regime, the camps, the externalization, and we try also to give tools to civil society and migrant struggle. And we, okay, we have been doing for the last 10 years uh, several maps, which you can find on the website, about the camps in Europe, which were, and here we put myself a paper, one of the few paper I wrote 10 years ago, which said that the camps in, of Europe are not the camps in Europe, because they are so far away, and now they are far and far away. And also the death in the seas and in the Mediterranean, no, the death in the Mediterranean, we are not the only ones to do that. It's more collaborative uh, enterprise. But I think we should also, and I was thinking about that, listening to Sandro and La Bestia and to other of the, I think we should also consider uh, inquiring about the death in the desert and the desert being also a way, as Sandro said, to go outside Europe and the uh, American Mexican desert, which is so deathly, but also the Sinai desert, to address the question of the smugglers, but the real smugglers, the company, the big white scholar company who have clandestine operations and not the smugglers, which 20 years ago were nice people, heroic people, and who now are terrorists and hate terrorists. It's also a good shift when migrants became terrorists and became clandestine and became, uh, the smugglers became also bad people. This, uh, it's also as to see with what we heard yesterday on uh, the period of the Cold War, was it something between uh, the, the Western world and the Eastern world and then, okay, this also a matter to discuss. But I think we should discuss absolutely this idea of the death in the desert to map them in the Sahara also, because we know our friends, our migrant friends, and also our, migrant, our activist friend in Morocco often say that people caught while trying to uh, enter in Ceuta and Melilla, going over La Valle, uh, caught by the Moroccan police, are taken by vans, which are followed by the activists as far as they can, and they are often left into the desert, very far from the, the Mali border to, uh, to die. And there's also these stories that there are some activists who put uh, water in the desert in Arizona, and there are also vigilantes who come and who shoot them who shoot um, the, gal the, the bottles, and so there's nothing there. So I think question of, yeah, the law, the question of the uh, transnational citizenship, and also the question of the, de the other space, which is a space as bizarre as the, as the sea to, uh, to be investigated. <laughs>